uh, to upstream number 75, codename Signal. Today we have a really special guest for all of you. It's uh, Sean Silka. He's the co-author of Losing the Signal, which is a fantastic book and, and look into you know, the rise and fall of BlackBerry and kind of the background stuff that went on behind the scenes that you don't necessarily get from reading um, news articles and, and different types of uh, um, pieces from those times. So uh, we're very lucky to have him on uh, today. Um, welcome, Sean. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, we also have uh, two of our regulars. We have uh, James, who kind of swapped with me today. Uh, he's letting me take the reins on this episode. How you doing, James? Doing quite well, Brandon. How's it going? Pretty good. Can't complain. Uh, we also have uh, web designer extraordinaire, uh, Alex. He's also got an HD camera today for the occasion, so he's looking extra white today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got it for you guys. No, I'm I'm looking forward to this. It's always nice to have a guest on, so it should be an interesting episode. Yes. Um, so I guess it's been a... How long has it been since the proof's been out? It's been a three weeks, or or how long has it been? From, I can tell you specifically, yeah, yeah exactly. it, it, two and a half weeks, because I was having a little bit of a problem, and the, you have like a 14-day return policy, and it was 15 days, so I had uh, you know, really try and weasel my way in there, and they, they gave me the replacement device, but I'd, I'd argue a little bit, but, yeah. <laughs> so it's been about, you know, two weeks, three weeks and change, whatever. Um, the device has been out. It's relatively new. And uh, we have the CEO talking about the Priv's role in future successes. Um, here's a quote that he gave to CNBC uh, this week saying, I quote, this is the big deal in terms of getting receptivity from the market. We want the market to tell us what they like and what they don't like, and we'll adjust accordingly." End quote. Now, what do you guys think about this quote in terms of you know, where he's taking the company going forward? I'll start off with you, uh, James. Yeah, I, I, I echo with John Chen so much. I just put out my review of the Priv literally last night, early this morning, and in the review, a little bit of what I get towards summary in is that this device feels like finally, finally BlackBerry is listening to us, right? It seems like over the years with BlackBerry 10, Z10, you know, we want the all-touch form factor, but we also want the BlackBerry stuff. So they've, they've trialed out a bunch of products in the market, and really those devices haven't stuck with a lot of the consumers and haven't garnered a lot of the attention that they've wanted. And finally, that final qualm we had was applications and ecosystem. So what does BlackBerry do? They build the priv to basically silence those compromises. So I really think that BlackBerry is finally listening, and that is a software show. So I totally agree. John Chen's going to listen to the market and see what they want. I guess the question becomes, will priv be what people actually want, and can they convince users around the world of that? That's some good points. I mean, definitely receptivity of this device, based on what I've read on the Internet and stuff, has is, is definitely been... A, a pleasant change based on you know some of the past devices we've seen over the past two years where you know it wasn't so much about the hardware being the issue it's just the, the underlying software and application dilemma that was always at the forefront of these reviews and it's kinda nice getting some of these new reviews coming in talking about how applications aren't necessarily the issue anymore and it's kinda one of those things that I think Chen is really playing a let's wait and see approach to this device to see if it really takes off and to see if they can kind of leverage Android in the future. What, what are your thoughts, Alex? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think we're kind of seeing that BlackBerry really is just paying attention to, that they understand that they rely on us to make them successful again. If we don't buy their device, then they're going to have to fold the hardware business. So, of course, you know, they want to focus on asking us, you know, what do you guys want? And I, it kind of echoes this fact when um, in Google Play, I, I left kind of a review on BlackBerry Hub, and I immediately got a response back. And, you know, they, they said, yeah, you know, we'll look into doing this, and thank you for the feedback and everything. It just shows that they're actually, you know, paying attention to their users. And they know, like, it, it's a good thing, because when you get to be such a large company, a lot of the times you just kind of do your own thing. But at the end of the day, if you just act like a smaller developer and just pay attention to your users, they will tell you what they want, and they will help make you successful, so it's just, you know, good to see it. And, and that's an interesting link that we can kind of kind of tie back to, to Sean's book there, is kind of 
around 2008, 2009, the, co the company was kind of, their focus is kind of on something different, being more efficient with data, um, being something that was kind of very good from a, from a fiscal aspect in terms of data usage and, and what companies or corporate users might have wanted, but not exactly what consumers wanted. And, and Apple came in and kind of blew the doors open uh, where, you know, being efficient with data wasn't necessarily a priority for consumers. Uh, and it's interesting to see that shift now where we see China's kind of trying to see, really pinpoint what consumers want and, and really give them something that they want. Sean, uh, I'd, I'd be really interested to get your perspective on how you think um, the Priv device, this Android device, really plays into BlackBerry nowadays and, and going forward. Well, I, I guess the question is, you know, is anyone actually going to show up to buy this? Um, certainly, uh, BlackBerry fishing atos. I mean, the company's still selling, um, you know, hundreds of thousands, a little over a million devices a quarter. So there are still BlackBerry buyers. But, you know, you can argue that um, BlackBerry 10 operating system came out six years after uh, the iPhone appeared, which is, uh, you know, nobody has six years in technology for a, for a true competitive response to a new rival. And uh, an Android phone out of this company is probably five years too late. Um, a lot of people are going to say, who cares? Uh, BlackBerry finally has an Android phone. I've given up the keyboard. The keyboard is, uh, is an old form factor for a lot of people. The vast majority of people who use smartphones nowadays uh, never even, didn't even grow up, uh, I guess, in the smartphone uh, era having keyboards to use. So it's, it's not technology that people have adopted. And a lot of people who have given up Blackberries have not gone back, um, even when they updated to the BlackBerry 10, when they went to the Classic. Uh, remember, the Classic was supposed to be the device that brought people back to the fold, and we just have not seen that in the numbers. Um, I, uh, my colleague Shane Dingman reviewed the phone. He gave. I haven't actually used it yet. I've used the Classic and the Passport, um, but I haven't actually seen the Priv except, uh, except on uh, videos and such. And his review is it's a great device, but it's too expensive. Uh, in Canada, it's $899. That's about $200 more than comparable Android devices, frankly, um, that, and it has year-old technology. So the question you have to ask is, are people going to go stampeding back into the stores to buy this? And furthermore, are carriers going to put the effort into uh, marketing a device from a company that commands about a third of 1% uh, of the market? Um, you know, when you're still making devices and you have that kind of market share, you're kind of at the back of the store. So you're not going to get the same kind of marketing heft uh, that, say, a Verizon or a Bell will give to a Samsung or Apple phone. So it could be a really great phone, and it might uh, put a bit of wind in their sails, but, but there's massive headwinds uh, against this company. Um, and, you know, the fact that BlackBerry has an Android will... If I've got all my stuff now on a Samsung and I've been using it, and, I, and I'm, by now we're all kind of comfortable, I think, in our smartphones for the most part. If you've been using Apple products <coughs> for five years or Samsung products for five years, you know, you have to be wrenched out of that to go into a different device. And, and I don't know enough about the Android operating system, to be honest, but I think people are kind of settling into their ways. This is now a maturing market uh, in smartphones, so I don't know how much more than thumbs are left for BlackBerry. I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say about that. You know, it's interesting that you bring up, uh, you know, pricing, obviously, and there's a lot of people, I've been reading on various sites whenever there's the reviews of the Priv, and a lot of people are saying, you know, BlackBerry needs to release this phone at cost, they need to gain back market share, and, and to me, I'm like, you know, what, at this point, being on an Android device, what does market share even mean? Is that, you know, it's really not as important as it is when you have a standalone operating system. So what what do you feel, Sean, that, that a good price point would have been for the Priv? Because, again, I don't really think market share is, is what they should be focusing on right now. They need to make money from this phone. What is it that gets people into the stores and say, boy, I have to buy a BlackBerry. I have to buy the, the BlackBerry Android device. And, and there are some who would argue they just shouldn't be even bothering with hardware anymore. So I think... John Chen has to go out to the market and, and prove that the world wants Blackberries. And we're only going to see that in the sales numbers. They haven't wanted passports. They haven't wanted classics. They, they haven't wanted uh, Blackberry. I mean, the sales numbers keep going down. Um, and, this, and the question is, how much farther can they, can they go? I mean, is this, is this the last device from the company? They're talking about a device roadmap in the new year. But, uh, you know, it wasn't long ago that he was saying he needed to make 10 million sell 10 million devices a year yeah. uh, to make mm -hmm. money. That shouldn't be as, that shouldn't be hard. 
Now it's apparently five million devices. When is it going to be two? You know, at what point yeah. in a market where you sell 1.3 billion smartphones a year and you can't even crack 10 million, do you say, well, maybe we just shouldn't be in the smartphone business anymore? And, and you, you got to kind of wonder is with the play with the priv kind of to attract – you know, some BlackBerry users who had recently left or attract maybe some existing BlackBerry 10 users who want to kind of switch over to Android or, you know, providing that niche little aspect where there might be that segment of people on Android who are looking for a physical uh, keyboard device. I mean, if we look over the past year with, uh, what's his name? Uh, what's it called? The, the American Idol guy who was building the keyboard for Ryan iPhone. Ryan Seacrest, yeah. Um, <laughs> There's definitely some people who do, you know, it, it seems kind of funny today where, where the standard is touch, touch screen devices. It seems like there are a few people who are entrenched in those ecosystems who are kind of looking towards getting a keyboard. Um, but as you said, it's, it's very, de it's, it, it's very, it really depends on what those people want. And it's really, like you said, people are entrenched in those ecosystems and it's really, it remains to be seen whether people are going to, you know, pick up a BlackBerry device that's really expensive when they can be, you know, supplemented with a cheaper Android device for a lot of similar functionality. Here's, an, here's another side of that argument as well, and this is something that kind of goes right to the core of uh, us core BlackBerry users, right? With the Priv, you're basically selling me or reselling me the same things that I already have on my BlackBerry Passport or my BlackBerry Classic in terms of hub, you know, some of the productivity features, the calendar and such. So it's, ev it's even a harder sell because as we mentioned, you know, people are very much rooted in the si systems that they're in where I'm pretty comfortable with BlackBerry 10 as it is. Do I, can I justify such a high price tag to be resold, basically the same things I've already purchased? So I, I would agree it's going to be a tough sell at this price range for BlackBerry. But as we discussed on our last podcast, they do have this quote-unquote Vienna device. Now whether that roadmap for new hardware will materialize for them remains to be seen. I think that they're going to need some kind of budget device to balance if they're going to have any hope whatsoever to hit close to that 5 million mark because they need something overseas that can sell. And, and right now BlackBerry phones are not in terms of BlackBerry 10 devices. What kind of budget device do you think they would have to make? You know, we've seen already this Vienna device, and it's looking like a, a candy bar QWERTY, which a lot of people have wanted for a while, right? A lot of people have... They like the square form factor, but they don't want to give up a lot of the screen real estate. And Android itself as an OS doesn't technically lend itself perfectly to the square resolution. W yeah. Is this Vienna device the answer? I think it can be. But as we've discussed prior, I mean, hardware has always been nice from BlackBerry. It's really been the software and the marketing, moreover, that's been a real, real issue. Sean, what insights on marketing do you have from BlackBerry? Because really, people don't even know these products exist. You pull out a classic, you pull out a passport. So many people are just unaware that these are in-market devices that BlackBerry's recently released. Do you think there is a way for them to kind of, you know, break the wall and, and get the, the receptivity of these devices up so people are aware that they exist? It's hard, you know. I mean, BlackBerry was very good on its way up of leveraging the uh, the carriers, playing the carriers off one another uh, to get into markets and. Um, uh, you know, using their marketing dollars. And when, when you have the carrier marketing dollars behind you, you've got powerful programs and, and, and you know, it's, it's make or break if you have to have them uh, behind you. I, you know, I've been, I've given uh, probably about 20 talks in relation to the book and a lot of them are, uh, in the last few months, a lot of them are, are, there's young people there, people are 30 or under. You pull out a BlackBerry now and it, it they they can't believe it. It's almost like they want to, it's like, it's like you've pulled out something from King Tut's Crypt, you know. I mean, there it's 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 really like an heirloom. Uh, people can't believe that I actually still use a BlackBerry. Um, any pretty much aside from you guys, you know, you're 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 BlackBerry aficionados. But as you well know, for the vast majority of the public, it's it's technology that does it may as well not even exist. And certainly not in America, uh, where BlackBerry really hasn't been a factor probably since about 2010 or 2011. It's just as far as most people are concerned, it's just vanished, and people don't even really realize that it's still around. So if they haven't been able to break through with a series of devices now, the Passport, particularly the Classic, which was supposed to kind of signal the turnaround, and, and that really hasn't happened, I don't see how it's going to be very difficult for them to break through. I mean, you walk through Times Square, any, I mean, Samsung, Apple, these, these, are giant, these are giant, enormous billboards that are funded by 
crazy um, ad budgets that that a, that a relatively little company like BlackBerry just can't afford. Um, and I don't know if we've seen the kind of guerrilla marketing um, that that would be required to break through. But for guerrilla marketing to break through, you kind of need a, a receptor on the other end, and that would sort of be younger people who, for whom BlackBerry is just sort of it's non-existent technology anymore. So I, I don't know how. I don't know what the magic formula would be um, if they're going to try and do it through um, through marketing. Again, I mean, they finally got the software piece figured out. Like BlackBerry 10 has been uh, second-rate software. I, I was saying to you guys earlier, I mean, I, I use it as a journalist for Facebook and Twitter, and I can't tell you how frustrated I am using the, the, the uh, BlackBerry 10 clients for both of those applications. Yep. Uh, those apps it. haven't been updated in months, so... Yeah. You know, the frustration is understood for sure. Yeah, yeah so. Blaze, it'd be uh, be interesting. Well, for everybody who's listening, Blaze has joined us. He got confused because he's in Arizona. The Hi, different zone. Zone. <laughs> <laughs> Blaze, uh, editor in chief of uh, Crack Perry, has joined us. Uh, Blaze, I'd like to get your thoughts on. We see these fan renders of the Vienna on Crackberry, um, and we're just kind of talking about. You know, there's a lot of confusion. In my mind, I mean, BlackBerry gets to a point where there's some diminishing returns, you know. Every device, it seems, in the past year or two has been like, this is the break, you know, the make it or, or die device, right? And it's like, it gets to a point where it's kind of like that kind of urgency and that kind of, you know, you know, whole kind of aura behind a device kind of ends up getting diminishing returns because after you have three or four devices that are make or break devices and nothing really happens, it kind of dilutes the whole urgency of that device and it kind of makes it fall to the wayside because, you know, maybe before when you had a make or break device, uh, a company like uh, Techno Buffalo or something might review it because it's a very pinnacle device, you know, an important device for BlackBerry and, and they want to see if maybe this last goal will have some effect. But after you have three or four like that, you might start losing, you know, people's interest like that, right? Because people want a story with the device, right? So uh, I'm I'm interested to see from your perspective, uh, Blaze, how you see maybe some of these future renders uh, come into play. Well, I think I think when when it comes down to the devices and basically like you know giving those individual devices the make it or break it sort of scenario isn't isn't really appropriate because I mean. When you take a look at the past devices, what what have we had? We've had the Passport, we've had the Classic, we've had the Leap, and you know, arguably, everybody has placed those uh, make it or break it statements directly on those devices. Like even Sean mentioned that you know the the Classic was supposed to be one of the devices that made or break the break the company, but really, I don't think that that was necessarily the case. I think we were all probably a little bit too quick to actually go ahead and give those devices that title because you know fundamentally. Um, you know, they're all running the, the exact same operating system, you know. BlackBerry 10 was part of, you know, part of the problem with, with what has happened in BlackBerry's history. Like, no matter what device you picked up, you were still getting a BlackBerry 10 device at the core, right? Um, you know, and, and the operating system is... For as good as it is, it's one of those things that has essentially held them back because we all know at the core the problem is that it didn't really have the app so if there was if there was any device that I could say would make or break the company it would probably be, um, you know essentially be the priv at this point because the priv is a departure from BlackBerry 10 you know it, people are looking at the priv in it under more of a light because of the fact that it, it doesn't bring all of the exact same problems that you know BlackBerry 10 had you know that's the device that is the differentiator because of the fact that it runs Android, because of the fact that it has, you know, all of these uh, applications available to it. Because, again, once once you bought a BlackBerry 10 device, you know, that was it. The only differentiator between them was actually the form factor. It still carried over all the exact same problems that everybody had with BlackBerry 10, which nobody, you know, was really interested in. Um, and when it comes down to the Vienna and essentially the roadmap, I, I don't know... It, it, it it's kind of hard for me to say that, yeah, the Vienna is probably going to come out because of the fact, like, you know, I think that they're, they're, they may have these roadmaps lined up. They may have these ideas that they're going to essentially go ahead and push out to market. Um, but I think a lot of it actually depends on how 
how well the the priv is actually received. I think you know if the priv doesn't do as good as what John Chen expects it to, then I think he's going to essentially go ahead and sit down and reevaluate that entire roadmap and determine whether or not it's something that they want to go ahead and push forward with. Um, because like Sean said, you know, people have been arguing that BlackBerry should get out of hardware for years and upon years now, right? Um, you know, I think, I think Chen's going to have a, a really hard look at the actual returns on, on, on Priv and see where to go from there. I mean, they may have all these things in the pipeline, but it's not, I don't think it's fully determined whether or not they're going to go ahead and push them all out. That's a good point. Now, uh, with, now with Priv, if we're looking at it from a strategic standpoint, you know, they've made the acquisition of good technology, they're pushing hard in the MDM space and EMM, expanding on the enterprise side of things. John Chen has mentioned that he's got his enterprise sales teams going out trying to sell the Bez 12 software, and at the end of the day, to make the sale, they are ending up having to sell Samsung or iPhones to actually linchpin the deal and make it happen. So now at least BlackBerry has an Android device that's secure to their measure, you know, FIPS certified, all that good stuff, so that they have a product that they can push that's their own, as opposed to having to sell Bez 12 software with something like a Samsung connected to Knox or potentially an iPhone. But again, can they hit that five million dollar target off of their their existing customers trying to bring them over? And and I don't see fleets, you know, trying to upgrade their entire workforce to something like the Priv. It's it's going to be tough for them. They need to find a middle ground there to actually make that sale go through. And and it's interesting because, I mean, coming into that figure, the five million devices, it's it's really going to come down to, you know, it looks like the bar the marketing budget. At BlackBerry is, is is very small, so it's really going to come down to these users who get the device and kind of convince other people that see the device to buy it. Kind of almost organically, like how BlackBerry originally uh, started growing, right? Um, which kind of ties into our next um, piece, our next talking point here is uh, Good Morning America. How they're handing out they were handing out about forty cribs. Um, to fans in the morning to celebrate, uh, what what was it to celebrate? Um, it was basically 40 years of Good Morning America. 40 years so, of Good Morning America. Yeah, so Good Morning America has essentially been airing for 40 years, and they did that in part of celebration to basically go ahead and celebrate the 40 years of Good Morning America. 40 years on air, 40 privs, there you go. It's a, it's a little bit of a... You know, a good faith effort at some marketing for BlackBerry while also doing a little bit of celebration with Good Morning America. And to me, I mean, that was probably one of the best things that they have done in terms of marketing for, you know, quite a long period of time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you definitely get a bunch of people who see it who probably didn't know about it, and now they're like, oh, you know, they might not have gotten that device, wanted device, but they're like, oh, this device is interesting. Let's see. Let's look into it a bit more and research it a bit more. Uh, what are your thoughts, Alex, on this? Yeah, you know, I think it's definitely interesting. It's been pretty obvious that BlackBerry has not been throwing much money into marketing. I mean, you look at they've been doing it elsewhere, kind of throwing it into their website and, and doing things like this Good Morning America. Um, I wonder how much money it's actually saving them in the long run because, again, we really haven't seen any TV commercials for the phone or anything. Um, but I, I think it makes sense. So people who are watching Good Morning America a lot, I'm sure they have quite a large viewership. Um, they may check out and see this phone and be like, hey, you know, it, there, people are talking about it, and I think that's the good thing. If no one's talking about BlackBerry or if they're only talking in a negative light, that's a, that's a bad thing. But here, you know, it's like kind of sponsoring the event and then they gave away a bunch of free ones and everyone in the background, they're happy. You see this one guy with like a Z10 holding it in the background. So obviously there's some, you know, BlackBerry enthusiasts there. Um, I, I don't know. I, I guess it'll be interesting to see. I just wonder if whatever sales happen with the Priv, if it's due to their new marketing efforts, which kind of don't really exist too much right now, they're definitely different. Or if it's because, you know, it's a good device or because it's running Android. Like, I, I wonder what the reasoning for whatever ends up happening is due to what. And, and you know what, Alex, is that with BlackBerry, you can always speculate. We can speculate until, you know, <laughs> we're falling asleep, right? We never know. 
But it's it's definitely something that always keeps us on our toes, figuring out what BlackBerry's next move is with regards to marketing, because you know it remains to be seen exactly what is clearly going on in the background there um, with this marketing strategy. Um, shifting over, shifting gears a bit over, I'd like to shift our focus on to, uh, I guess it was a a BlackBerry Priv stress test um, that was <laughs> done this week. I think it's. You know, every little kid's uh, dream to just kind of break, you know, gadgets and cell phones and stuff like this. But th these guys um, do it every time a new phone comes out. They stress it to to figure out how good it functions, how how well it 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 holds up to some. A lot of them, a lot of the time, they do it to extreme stresses that we don't usually, um, you know, have our phones undergo. But uh, it's what do you guys think about the results? It didn't look too bad. Before I, before I jump into that, can I just say something very quickly about the, the Good Morning America segment that I don't think a lot of people actually paid attention to? Yeah, by all means. Those devices were AT&T devices. A lot of people glanced over that fact. Like, you know, AT&T is the exclusive, well, yeah. kind of exclusive carrier for <laughs> now. So a lot of people didn't really pay too much attention to that fact. But those those were AT&T devices, and that leads back to what Sean said about, you know, the importance of carriers and carrier pushes at this point. You know, people paid attention, some people paid attention to the AT&T uh, portion of that, and others didn't. Like, the majority of BlackBerry blocks didn't necessarily pay attention to that because, it, you know, it's like a common thing. But, you know, other people out there, they noticed that it was, you know, AT&T marketing at that point in time, too, which... You know, even though it wasn't necessarily high highlighted, it was it was a good thing to have on their side because, you know, it goes goes back to what Sean was saying about the the importance of carriers. They need carriers to be able to go ahead and help them out. Um, but in regards to that stress test, that was absolutely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> if we see here on Alex, they just, you know, I wish I had a budget to do this just for fun. <laughs> right. It's it's kind of interesting. I was surprised. With the durability of this back, yeah, I've seen it on the Z30, and it's not as uh, it seems more durable on the Priv, especially in terms of texture, where you can kind of get away with some of these in terms of sharp edges hitting it. Further along in the video, you see the camera module on the back is actually very sensitive to scratches. So Priv users, as you see here, you're gonna want to be very careful how you put that phone down. With you know, don't put keys in the same pocket because it's very easy to scratch up that lens and ultimately ruin your camera module in so doing. Uh, I was very impressed to see the lighter that was used on the front end. Um, very cool to see that the screen kind of healed itself with heat, which I thought was kind of interesting. You see the heat will kind of dissipate, and the pixels actually stay fully active, which is awesome. Yeah, and it was interesting when he pulled out um, the keyboard, and you kind of see that it has this, like, rubber backing, so, like, little crumbs or whatever is not going to kind of get back there. Um, it's kind of interesting to see. I would never pull my keyboard out, so it's kind of nice to have someone do something like that. I'm still personally waiting for like an iFixit teardown where they just literally break the entire device to part. I want to see what that spring mechanism is yeah. that's actually holding this phone together because the sliding uh, just feels great on the device. I'm more interested, like, like you, James, I want to <laughs> see that, but I'm more interested in the pricing of the components. You know what I mean? Like... We know we all know how much BlackBerry is actually <laughs> charging us to pick up this phone, um, you know, be it Canadian pricing or American pricing. I want to know how much they're actually paying to yeah. have it built. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sean, I'd like to ask you a question because through reading your book, uh, I got this this notion that Mike Mike Lazaridis is the type of guy he got lots of phones all the time. I think it was Rim Building Four. He would always break them down, analyze every single piece, and I know he's not he doesn't work. For BlackBerry anymore, but I wonder if in his spare time, do you think he maybe has a priv there and he's kind of looking at the inside to see, you know, if there's anything needing it? Oh, I wouldn't doubt it. You know, Mike's uh, Mike's a scientist at heart. I mean, this is a guy who's, uh, you know, uh, he spent his days at work uh, thinking about sci like all things science, right? And then uh, that was his hobby as well. He'd go home with product manuals and. He'd pick stuff apart. He would he would drive into Jim's office sometime and say, you know, did you know that the blah 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 and like some science would come pouring out of his mouth and Jim would just kind of like nod there politely, listen to him, kind of go on. I mean, Jim uh, Mike was just 
you know, I, it, this is just the way Mike is, and I'm sure every single device that's come out, even though he's not part of the company anymore, and I think he sold most, if not all, of his shares finally. Oh yeah, I mean, he's 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 a he's a devoted BlackBerry user. I think there's uh, there's still that that pride for him, and no doubt he, you know. Uh, he probably, I, I'm guessing, uh, cracked open the priv and said, "Oh, that's interesting. I see what they've done there." And I'm, I'm sure he had critiques as well. Um, yeah. You know, when when the when the uh, Torsten Heinz was running the company and they were working on the BlackBerry 10, uh, you know, Mike came with a long list of of suggestions. Um, you know, what they should be doing with the product. Uh, they didn't take all the suggestions, which was sort of, it was jarring and hard for him because I think he thought he would still have. More of a role, more of a, a kind of a direct role in in, in the design and development, um, and, and probably the I think the first BlackBerry tens suffered for that kind of lack of institutional knowledge that that Mike had. I mean, certainly you saw some of the things like the um, like the some of our favorite um, um, uh, shortcuts kind of disappeared suddenly on the BlackBerry ten, and there was a real yeah. there was like a lot a loss of muscle mass almost. Um, but uh, certainly in the last interviews we did with Mike, there was that. There remain that pride and that curiosity and that uh, I think lifelong devotion to to BlackBerry products. So uh, I guess we'll get started on. There's a few questions I had on the top of my head that I wanted to ask you, Sean. We're going to take some questions from uh, some people that that have tweeted us and have messaged us on our BBM channel. Um, I guess my first question. Well, the first thing I want to mention before uh, I get into the questions is that. I'd like to congratulate you on your book. It's uh, it was shortlisted for the Financial Times slash McKinsey Business Book of the Year award, um, and has been named one of the best business books of the year by the Wall Street Journal, Journal, and uh, Strategy and Business Magazine. And it's also it was also released earlier in Canada, and the U.S., and Holland, and is out this month in the rest of the Commonwealth. So for all our listeners in the U.K., South Africa, India, etc. You can go out right now and take a look at this book, and it's a really great book to get. Like I mentioned earlier, some insights into what happened behind the scenes with BlackBerry. So, I I think I remember I was talking to you earlier in the show. You had a book that was fresh off the press, hot, uh, a few days ago. Yeah. Right from Random House Publishing, UK. Okay. So, my first question. Um, it became apparent during the book that. You know, BlackBerry was a startup, and it felt like a startup a lot, a lot, a long, most of the way through its development. Uh, I mean, it was continually trying to meet demand, and it always had to juggle, you know, those resources of meeting demand and kind of innovating on the same time. And I think a lot of startups struggle with this. And I was wondering, from from your perspective, do you think the need to continually keep up with that demand, which was such a huge pressure? Had a large impact on the innovation aspect of it, and kind of, kind of was, not, like, w was one of the big factors that led to to them kind of falling behind when it came to iPhone and other competitors racing in. Yeah, it's a good. It's a really good question. You know, one of our original title for the book, and, and we went through about fifty titles before we finally settled on losing the signal, was uh, the startup that never grew up. So it's interesting to hear you make that specific reference. Yeah, this this is a company that was growing twenty five percent quarter to quarter. Um, and you know, there's a lot of startups nowadays that, that have that kind of growth rate or even higher. But when you're into the billions of dollars and you're still growing at that rate, I mean, that means basically having to expand your footprint globally with with manufacturing and and they were running into all sorts of issues uh, with product quality is you know product quality really took a nosedive everyone loved the pearl when it came out but uh, that little rollerball was a nightmare because it collected dust underneath and, and uh, there were all kinds of other issues and they were just scaling up so quickly and, and expanding their their production that uh, the, the product quality really became a major problem I think one of the things we re really wanted to do with the book was um, you know, by the time we started on this, there were a lot of BlackBerry was kind of like the corporate whipping boy um, of the world. People dismissed it, they made fun of it. They said, "Oh, they, you know, they they missed the boat. They didn't see Apple coming. They had their their head in the sand." Uh, you know, Jim was too busy trying to buy hockey teams. You know, a lot of these kinds of criticisms. <laughs> and one of the things we really wanted to do and, and make this real a, a true case study is take people back to that moment. And, and, and show people the context uh, in which they're making decisions. And it's really, really challenging. Um, you know, you could make the argument that 
the moment Steve Jobs came out on stage and pulled out the iPhone and showed it to the world in January 2007, from that moment onward, BlackBerry had to do everything right, like not get a single thing wrong. And of course, the opposite happened. I mean, their first product was Storm, which wasn't a, it was supposed to be a touch screen uh, to counter the Apple, and it, it was a BlackBerry version of a touch screen, but it had the old it had the old software platform, and it. it just looked like old technology. It felt more like a machine, like a like like a seriously like a piece of hardware than a than a than a piece of software that happened to have hardware around it. So they they kind of got the form factor, and the and 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 the ethos of the product. Um, uh, wrong, you know. They they dismissed Apple at first. They thought nobody was going to like, um, uh, you know, having to plug their phone in every four hours. Uh, they didn't know how the carriers were going to be able to handle all this extra data traffic from having full browsers. Uh, they didn't think anyone would want to type on glass uh, because it was an inferior experience, and, and they thought that the security would be a problem. Here we are, seven years later. BlackBerry sales are like a tenth of what they were, and they're still talking about security, and yet the world seems to pass them by, which is kind of kind of interesting. So I think, you know, at the same time though that Apple comes along, BlackBerry sales are still skyrocketing. In fact, two years later, in 2009, they were crowned the world's fastest growing company. They were shooting out the lights in markets like Indonesia, South Africa, uh, Argentina, you name it. Countries, by the way, that still were on old 2G networks and where the, the iPhone and where apps were not really a factor. So they kind of owned that market for a few years and they continued to until you know, um, a lot of the carriers in those markets started to, to started to finally invest in upgrading their networks. They had a long runway. They were posting immense sales, and it was hard to know uh, which direction to go. Jim called it. Jim Balsilli, the co-CEO, called it a period of strategic confusion. Should they play in apps? Should mm -hmm. they ditch the operating system? Should they go Android? Should they get rid of the of the keyboard? And think, if you were the CEO of a company and you made some of those suggestions, how would your board and how would your investors have reacted? You know, guys, we've got to ditch the keyboard and we've got to go in all in, um, or we've got to just go low end and uh, and forget about competing with Apple and just run down the you know the bolds and the curves. And a lot of those decisions would have uh, would have put them in the crosshairs of very angry uh, shareholders. Um, so it, it's it's. <coughs> It's hard to see what they what they could have done. I mean, Apple so changed the game, and part of how what they changed also is they they got the carriers to go along with them. I mean, in the old days, you remember, uh, an app on a BlackBerry in like 2005 is a ringtone. I mean, that's you know the carriers yeah. didn't really like apps, and it was only because Apple was able to play the carriers off one another when they put their music on the Sprint phone and everyone thought they were coming that Bell South uh, at AT and T were basically willing to give. Steve Jobs exactly what he wanted, and that meant an app store, and that meant a full browser on the phone, um, and these were, you know, these were very uh, well-defined parameters that the carriers had put around BlackBerry. They kind of boxed BlackBerry in, and BlackBerry was like, okay, we can live with this because we because everyone wants our phone. But when you yeah. suddenly change the rules underneath it, it's a whole new game. Like a, a modern comparison would be Uber, right? Uber didn't just come up with a great app. And now it owns the transportation business. It now has to go and fight a ground war, municipality after municipality, to get the municipalities to change the rules. Because right now Uber is kind of like in this gray zone. And if municipalities all decide, you know what, we don't want Uber here, it's illegal, then Uber has no business. So yeah. quite often in technology, you have to go and change the standards. You have to you have to convince lawmakers to basically give your intellectual property value. And and that's kind of what Steve Jobs did with the carriers. He got them to change the rules to the effect that it uh, it, it, it kind of uh, tilted the scales against BlackBerry in a way BlackBerry was not expecting. But, but you know what's so fascinating about it is that you, you say that Apple came in and kind of changed the rules, but when BlackBerry initially came into carriers, they changed the rules as well. Um, Jim Balsilli played hardball and said, listen, you're going to give us $10 for every Black phone, uh, BlackBerry device that's sold mm -hmm. and uh, for service fees which was like an unheard of concept to these carriers who didn't want to give it up, but because BlackBerry was such an enticing product, they were saying, okay, the perceived value is three times as much as what they're asking for, so we can still make some money, some margin off of these service access fees, uh, which is interesting because, as you said, as you mentioned, iPhone came in and almost did a similar tactic, played hardball with the carriers to an extent and got exactly what they wanted out of it, um, to shift and mold stuff into their own uh, 
into their own um, advantage. And, and, and this draws another parallel between um, Jim Balsili's, um favorite book, which you mention in, in your book, is uh, The Art of War, where it continually talks about shifting the playing field to your advantage, which uh, Blackbeard, as they were go growing up and everything, had continually done, um, and it, it's what pushed them to the top. Um, I was wondering, Alex, uh, James, do you guys have anything to, to add to that? Any uh, comments? Yeah, it's it's interesting is that that data conversation, right? Because where BlackBerry's biggest boon was their data compression that excelled in in places that were previously mentioned. In a lot of those emerging markets, the data compression was actually a benefit to the carriers. Whereas in the U.S., which is rolling out the 4G L in the LTE technology shortly thereafter, iPhone was something they could take a risk on, and apps made sense because the data cost would go up and that cost was put off to the consumers, right? So it was really, you know, as we talked a little bit prior to Upstream, some of their biggest value propositions ended up being some of their most, you know, important setbacks to a degree. We talked a little bit about innovation. I think, honestly, their failure to innovate with the storm caused them more problems than not. Having waited a little bit, not letting Verizon push them toward a device that wasn't quite ready for the market ultimately hurt them in the long run. And it's tough because you don't want to be a me too. You don't want to follow the market that you started so, to a degree. But you have to kind of put that pride aside, and that seems to be something that the new management at BlackBerry really has done. They've put a lot of that stuff aside and focused on what the customer needs. If we look at it from you know an, a, a macro perspective right now, BlackBerry has turned its biggest weakness applications into arguably the PRIB's greatest strength. So it's very interesting to see how the history has unfolded and how hopefully, you know, a lot of what's mentioned in your book, Sean, is a history that does not repeat itself into the future of BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. Well, I think John Chen uh, uh, realized. I mean, he's made a lot of the right moves, but it's arguably it, you could argue that it's two to three to five years too late. I mean, the company had uh, had some uh, one of our working titles uh, that we thought about. But we we didn't go with it was blind spots. I mean, this company had enormous blind spots about, um, I think the phrase, that'll never work, is something that should be banished from any startup CEO's lexicon or any established tech CEO's lexicon. That'll never work. That new technology will never work. Because, um, you know, you read the innovator's dilemma, and often it's these technologies, these disruptive technologies that come in below your core market. You know, well, it's you know, where we play an enterprise, that's that's consumer, or, the, or we're high end, that's low end, and inevitably, what happens is the low end devices come along, and then those companies get better, and they move up the value curve, and they've re redefined a market, and if you stuck on your perch too long, you're you're basically like a um, a sitting duck. Um, I, you feel for Mike too, because you know, BlackBerry did so much work, um, had done so much work, you know, about a decade earlier, kind of convincing the carriers, convincing the IT departments that you know, the world wasn't going to go from 2G to 3G as fast as everyone thought. There was going to be a lag of five, six, seven years. And that gave enough time and confidence to invest in these very compact, efficient little devices that BlackBerry made, which didn't use up a lot of bandwidth, but delivered a, a you know, killer payload, like a great app of, of, of wireless email. And so Mike and Jim had actually convinced the carriers and convinced these guys, forget about 3G, Two and a half G is all you need. Instead of spending the billions of dollars to upgrade your networks, just spend a few hundred million dollars to give that extra data layer to the existing 2G networks, and you're off to the races, and you'll make a lot of money. So 10 years later, when Verizon was saying, well, we're going up to 4G, Mike came in again and said, well, you don't really need 4G, you know? And, and, and uh, there's this, this passage in the book in Barcelona where Verizon's invited all the device makers to show them their 4G products because they're about to go big on 4G. Mike didn't have a bag of 4G products. He had a physics lesson about why 4G was a bad idea mm -hmm. at that particular time. And the folks from Verizon left that meeting saying, well, I guess we have to fire BlackBerry now, more or less. And you see BlackBerry's market share. We saw some internal data show that um, their share of Verizon's smartphone sales went from about 96% to about 4% in about a year and a half, I think, or so, maybe a year wow. and a half years. I mean, yeah. they, just, they just cut their support completely for BlackBerry because 4G was how they were going to sell phones. It's where they were going to put their marketing dollars. They had an empty highway, essentially, that they wanted to fill up with all these data devices, and BlackBerry wasn't even going to play there. Um, 
Though, you know, again, as, as going back to the, these are blind spots the company had at a critical moment when it needed to be doing absolutely everything right. Yeah, sure. Sh sh oh, it's sorry. Let me ask you something, Sean. Do you, do you think that BlackBerry is still suffering from a disconnect with Verizon? Because, I mean, as you, as you noted in the book, I mean, there was a whole lot of problems with the storm, and basically BlackBerry sort of, that was when their, their total relationship went absolutely sour. Do you, do you still think that there's people within Verizon that hold, I don't know, it, I don't know what the, the appropriate word would be. Do you think there's people who, within Verizon who still hold a grudge against BlackBerry, and maybe that's as to why we don't necessarily see as much Verizon support for BlackBerry I, these I don't think days? So. No, I, I think I think very few people in business actually hold real grudges. Like I think Verizon, Verizon will sell anything it thinks it can sell, um, and it's happy to, you know, they've they've said publicly, uh, they and AT and T have said, you know, we'll we'll, we'll support. Uh, I think Verizon, it's certainly AT and T has said, you know, we'll support them. I mean, if 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 billions of people want Blackberries, they will sell Blackberries and they will put them into the front of their stores. But getting there is very difficult. You don't just make a better product. I mean, you need savvy. You need to have that pull, which BlackBerry originally had from the, the brokers and the lawyers and the CEOs. Uh, they had enormous pull from the market, and they were able to leverage that. I mean, this thing was born, th this initial wave of success was born because it was cool to have a BlackBerry. You had to have one to compete, to stay ahead. Uh, Jack Welch had one, and Michael Dell had one, and Bill Gates had one. I mean, like all the important people had a BlackBerry, and now like none of the important people have, have Blackberries. They still talk about that. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't have that same yeah. kind of kind of marketing pull, that same cachet. Like when Oprah held it up in 2003, like she was so mm -hmm. excited to have a BlackBerry. And y you can't really bottle that lightning again. I mean, John Chen is arguably making a lot of the great moves. I mean, he called up the carriers. He did what needed to be done, but it was just too late. The company had lost too much time and Sam's, I mean, they were so successful at creating a market for wireless data that, at, that Silicon Valley woke up and said, thank you very much, we'll take this. And then the world's largest component maker, you know, that had tried uh, to, to get into the smartphone business said, you know, we're going all in. And they and they, they spent like drunken sailors to build up a giant business. And Google decided to give away its operating system for free to all these handset makers. And then give a the other thing is they gave their 30% cut of app sales to the carriers as well which is a killer strategy and which, again, cuts the legs out from under BlackBerry because you wonder why Android sales just zoomed up in 2010, 2011 because all the carriers could see how much money Apple was minting off app sales and they were going to get that. You know, mm -hmm. So they went very quickly from not really trusting apps to opening the floodgates to Google, which gave them that cut because Google doesn't need that. I mean, it's very destabilizing for the other players when a Google comes along and their their play isn't smartphones, their play is just getting more people to use their services. So having that ubiquity of the 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 Android uh, platform out there is their play in this market. And uh, and it just I mean Apple was able to guard its franchise pretty well. It's still a small player percentage wise, but it has all the profits because you know it has all the profits from smartphone of smartphones, Google has a lot of the profits from the services and everyone else is battling it out for like essentially a net no profit or, or, or very little profit because of yeah. the, the dynamics that were created by, by Google and Apple. Even now the smartphone market I guess you could say is essentially dealing <laughs> with the effects of what Apple had on it. Like everybody else in the smartphone market has to deal with the changes that Apple has made. Like BlackBerry is still compared to Apple. Like how come BlackBerry can't roll out updates as fast as what Apple can, like that. Apple changed the game on them, so and like I said, we're we're still dealing with it. Well, and Apple has so much money too. I mean, it buys, yeah. you're you're really making, you know, you can't spend any money. Like they're really cutting to the bone. They're laying people. They're always laying people off. And Apple, you know, a Apple has more money than a lot of countries. So, <laughs> you know, it can afford to do things uh, that other that other companies can't, especially. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Sean, we're, we're talking so much about carriers and, and, you know, whenever we bring up BlackBerry and Apple in the past, it's always just so much about a, a carrier conversation, carrier marketing. Um, do you think that we'll ever get to a point in time where carriers will be decoupled from the hardware manufacturers? Uh, if I recall correctly, I think Sean had even mentioned, it's like having to contact your electric company for clearance before plugging in a toaster oven. It's just kind of, like, ridiculous. Do you think that there's ever going to be a point in time, or it's just it, there's so... 
you know, intertwined that it kind of needs to be this way. Well, you, you do need the carriers for that, um, you know, I, I guess that infrastructure that gets the signals to your, your phones. But, I mean, we've seen we've seen them become uh, disintermediated on the over-the-top services. Like, uh, I, I don't know if there's any SNS revenues left anymore in this business. Probably still tens of billions. I haven't looked recently, but, you know, the likes of WhatsApp and Kick and Facebook are, are basically going to drive that revenue line down to zero over time. Um, you know, we've heard for years the carriers trying to come back with their own competitive, rich communication service. But, you know, that's not the kind of thing the carriers can force on the market from the top down, and I don't think they could ever even agree on, on, a, on a standard. So it's that conversation that they, that they keep having. Um, you know, we're still early days, right? Like we're in inning one or inning two of this giant rewriting of the communication system. You know, like a, here in Canada, our big, uh, uh, you know, Bell Media has just laid off a bunch of people in, in TV and radio. Um, who knows what what the Netflix and Show Me revolutions are, are bringing? My my prediction is the day that Netflix uh, outbids the um, the networks for the Super Bowl is the day that uh, you know that that business is going to permanently change, and it will happen because they're going to be. It's probably already if it's not already richer than all of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are the things we grew up with uh, are just being um, fundamentally rewritten? I, I think the carriers have a bit more sustained advantage because you know they, they have to they have to bid on spectrum and they're the ones who spend billions laying the cables and and putting the towers up so um, you know I mean maybe Google and Apple will want to get into that business and, and buy them all up I, I'm not really sure but I think they have that sort of a bit more of that ingrained advantage because they they have that and perhaps they'll they'll find new ways to to put tolls in to kind of protect their revenue line I, I certainly wouldn't count the the telcos out yet but certainly uh, revenue streams that they, you know, they got drunk and happy on are, are, are definitely at risk or are declining. So I think that that business is being redrawn and will continue to be for some time. Yeah, especially as you look at people who, you know, you see a video of a, a product and a review, but you still want to actually put your hands on it. Apple has a great infrastructure of actual stores, and carriers are ultimately that store for a lot of other OEMs out there who don't have their own actual brick and mortar. So it's definitely kind of one of those points that gets a little bit contentious, and we'll see how their influence plays out for the future of some of their those hardware and product lines. So, uh, Brandon, what do we have from the Patreon supporters? So this, this first question is from Sean. First off, he says uh, he wanted to convey uh, to you, Sean, that he loved the book, and he was wondering if you've been in touch with Mr. Balsili or Mr. Lazaridis regarding uh, BlackBerry's new direction. Uh, yeah, I, I do. I do uh, keep up uh, with uh, with Jim. In fact, he's a, a very active player now, trying to um, encourage the the current crop of startups like the Shopify's and Hootsuite Canadian companies to to really get out there and have their message heard. So I've I've kept in fairly regular contact with him just through the course of being a Globe and Mail reporter, and and we actually did an on stage. My co-author Jackie McNish and I did an on stage interview with him. Um, uh, it's still online if uh, if your uh, viewers want to want to check it out. It's quite interesting to hear, you know, a distilled 40 minutes of Jim after the hours and hours we spent with him uh, interviewing him, sort of for people to actually hear in his own voice, uh, talking about some of the things he talked to us about in the book. Um, uh, so I still talk to Jim. Mike, uh, haven't talked to Mike yet actually since the book came out. So uh, Mike, Mike tries to stay off the radar, doesn't he? <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. He's, you know, he's also off in different directions. I mean, Mike's, uh, you know, Mike is, both of them are contributing immensely to, uh, to, to, to the life of, of, of their country and their, and their world. And I think, you know, their influence beyond BlackBerry will be felt for decades. Like, Mike's invested in quantum, uh, quantum physics. Um, he's, he's put a vast amount of his fortune into, into schools and really investing in, in like, in that very speculative next generation truly breakthrough technology. So, you know, uh, that's, that, you know, that's wonderful. And Jim is also, uh, as I said, he wants to help shape uh, public policy, um, take the lessons he learned from building BlackBerry into a $20 billion colossus and help the young crop of startups and, and show, you know, some of the savvy moves that you need to make. Like I talked about Uber, for example, you don't just create a great product. You have to work the halls of government, and you have to work the the standard setting bodies and that sort of thing. And so Jim is really trying to spread that message um, out, and and he's funded a couple of think tanks. And so you know both of them are making their mark. 
uh, beyond BlackBerry, and it's not going to ultimately define uh, what they do for uh, going forward. I mean, both incredible people, and uh, you know, one of the benefits of writing this book, frankly, is you get to spend hours and hours with these brilliant people, and you know, they oversaw a downfall of a company, but they also built uh, they also built this great company. They created the smartphone market. I mean, think about what that actually means. Yeah. We all live our lives out of our palms now. We carry the internet around everywhere. It's because these people forged a business out of nothing where no carriers would, nobody want, <laughs> they wanted wireless email and the carriers were more interested in paging and they had to forge this market. They had to fight every step of the way. And so, you know, uh, one of the things we liked about the story is we were able to sort of reclaim that, that build up and put it in the proper perspective of just how important this company yeah. has been to the history of the planet. Yeah, it's something that I believe that they don't necessarily get enough credit for in, in when people actually sit down and talk about BlackBerry. And luckily, losing the signal actually did that, you know, gave them their credit, which was greatly appreciated. And, and from my perspective, being, uh, you know, University of Waterloo's my alma mater, uh, I, I know when I was on campus, I couldn't walk anywhere without seeing some form of investment that was, you know, garnered by Mr. Lazaridis or Jim Balsili or from BlackBerry in general, whether it was I was in the co-op program at Waterloo, and I know there was a huge chunk of students that were able to fulfill their co-op uh, portion of their degree because they went and worked at BlackBerry. And, and so it, it's really like this company it had a huge investment, not just in terms of the overall wireless market, but in terms of a lot of you know, good things, get community building things that occurred in Waterloo and, and in Canada and across the world as well. Uh, another question I'd like to move on to here um, is from Mike Robinson. Uh, he says he hasn't read the book yet, but he's looking forward to reading it while he's on vacation. Um, but he was wondering if you, Sean, believe that BlackBerry have successfully turned around, or do you believe they're still failing? And adding to that, if you think they're still failing or being successful, uh, what exactly you're looking for, numbers or behaviors? Well, I, I've talked about behaviors. I think it's going to be hard to convince. Uh, we haven't seen evidence yet that the world needs more Blackberries, uh, and the numbers show that they seem to need less. So, you know, that's that's one thing to consider. Um, this is a company that's being very well managed on the bottom line. Like, it's not losing money right now, really. Uh, they've got, uh, you know, two or three billion dollars in cash. So, and they've got, I think, what is it, 44,000 patents. And we've seen the patents have value. So they, they have they have options. They have assets. And, you know, John Chen is a pretty shrewd, sharp, uh, sharp, uh, sharp leader. Um, but, you know, you have to look at the numbers, and the numbers tell a very dire picture. In their last quarter, they made uh, about $490 million in revenue, okay? That's down by about half year over year. When you cut that number down further, you see that 40% of it roughly is from hardware, and we know what's happening to hardware. But even more importantly, another 43%, like almost half of their revenues, is from service access fees. And those are being generated from old phones, bolds and curves, BB7s. Mm -hmm. So as, a B, as BB7s come out of, out of service, they're not booking those service access fees anymore, and they don't make those anymore on the BlackBerry 10 for a number of reasons, including the fact that Microsoft changed up its, uh, its, um, uh, it, you know, the the underpinnings of the of their whole system. Uh, so, you know, 43% of their current revenues are going down to zero. Um, they're talking about software uh, getting it up to 500 million dollars a year. I mean, maybe they'll buy that software. You know, maybe they're they're making this transition. It seems into being a device management company. But here's the thing about device management, okay? BlackBerry's re revenues at this height was $20 billion. The entire device management business, the entire whole thing is estimated by some at about $5 billion a couple of years ago. It might get up to $10 billion by about 2017. And it's a very competitive market. IBM's moved into it. Google's moved into it. You've got Citrix. You've got BlackBerry's the leader, but it's in a dogfight with some very large companies. And you have to ask, you know, do they... What are they? What's the special sauce that they bring here? So, you know, I think this company uh, has not. It, it's not a failing company. Uh, we haven't been. We didn't write its obituary, but you know, I would predict that it would be a lot smaller than it is now before they have that turnaround moment. I mean, maybe this is a hundred million dollar revenue company. It might be a very profitable one. QNX made 
very good money uh, as a software company, 50, 60, like a lot of software companies only make 50, 100, 200 million dollars. And if this is ultimately just going to be a software company, um, then the hardware revenues are going to go down and um, it, it, that, that, that could end up being its fate. I mean, maybe they can take all, that, all those assets and all that cash they have and invest it somewhere um, and make some, make some good returns off of it. But maybe someone will give me $2 billion or give you $2 billion. I mean, like any of us could take $2 billion and, and, and do something great with it or barely out earn bonds. Do you know what I mean? Like, the, like he's lucky because he's got all this money. He's inherited this great revenue stream, these great patents, um, and this big pile of cash. And maybe that's the best thing that he has right now is these great resources. The question is, is he smarter than any other CEO in terms of deploying them? So I don't know. I don't think we've seen what BlackBerry is going to become. I think you can tell I'm not that optimistic about the, uh, about the device business. Um, and the question is, how competitive are they in these other businesses? They've talked about Internet of Things for a couple of years. We haven't really seen what that strategy is. We haven't really seen what the, what the revenue potential is for it yet. I mean, a lot of people talk about Internet of Things, but it almost seems like that placeholder technology. Uh, it's like a black box. I mean, is that a $20 million business, a $50 million business, or a, or a $10 billion business? We don't know yet. So a lot of I have a lot of questions, um, and uh, I'm... Uh, I'm not waving a flag just yet. A white flag <laughs> or any other, uh, any other color. That's good to hear. Um, uh, another question here from Tim Roth. Um, he's uh, been reading your book. He's not quite through it all the way. He said the excerpt about how AT&T just didn't care about the iPhone was going to wreck their network was a fascinating uh, little thing that he didn't know about. Uh, his question uh, for you is if an American company had if an American company had made a serious offer to buy BlackBerry, do you think the Canadian government would have approved it? Very good question. We know that Lenovo was looking at BlackBerry and uh, might have made an offer and were basically warded off because you know there's this thing about Chinese companies buying um, you know buying essential technology and uh, it depends. Um, very possibly, I, it's 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 hard to know. Um, Jim Jim has a, a funny saying, you know, uh, Jim Balsilli, if uh, if a frog had wings, it wouldn't uh, bump its butt on the ground when it uh, when it took off. And what he means is, you know, asking what if questions um, is a fun exercise, but um, you, you know, like it, it, it's pu it's it's purely a, a fun parlor game, and and you can't really take anything from it because. Uh, because it's not a real question based on, on real inputs and outputs. Um, I, I think if it had been an American company, um, we would have had a very interesting drawn-out debate um, with, uh, with um, lobbyists brought in, uh, lots of ink and angst spilled on the editorial pages, and it probably would have come down to the government's mood on that particular day, where it came in, in the context of other uh, takeovers that sort of struck at the heart of Canadian sovereignty. It would have been really hard to see. Um, it, would have been, it would have basically been the government of the day probably licking its finger, putting it in the air, and seeing which way the wind blew. Um, so it, it's, it's hard to know. It would have been a totally contextual thing based on what was going on pol more politically at the time. But yeah, I think if, if Microsoft or, or Google had come in with a knockout offer, um, you know, it would have been hard to say no to. But again, that's sort of, if a frog had wings, right? <laughs> it's yeah. up in the air. There's, there's no actual answer there. <laughs> um, another question here from PB. He says, he really loved the book. Fascinating read. There seemed to be a faction of the company that wanted to go Android before around BB10's switch, the switch to BB10. Uh, he's wondering if you could speak a little on that, and if you, if you get the sense that if they had gone to add Android back then, whether they'd be in better shape now. Um, you know, I, that, that's a really good question. I, I don't think, I just don't think it would have happened at the time because Mike did not trust Android or like it. He was really... Um, you know, he, he was bothered by the security of it. Um, you, you know, this was a company divide, like seriously divided. Like Jim's half of the company and Mike's half were sort of um, kind of at loggerheads on a lot of things. And even within Mike's department, there was there was huge uh, upheaval going on. I mean, Mike really wanted to remake his uh, his organization. He was convinced that 
you know, the whole Java system was was out of date and, and needed to be. He didn't want to even hear the word Java. He called it spaghetti code, and uh, and that's because they had been, you know, the old system that had had so many patches along the way that it really needed to be cleaned up, which is why the last iteration of BB7 was, you know, some would argue the best operating system they ever made. Um, probably in retrospect, it would have made sense to go Android. I, I think. You know, in the clear light of day now, I think a, an Android system that, that retained the best elements of BlackBerry gave people the keyboard and put a modern smartphone in their hands that gave them all the apps, I think it would be a very different story for BlackBerry right now. I mean, just the fact that you can't order an Uber cab on anything prior to a priv from BlackBerry is, or, you know, that Instagram was, was hard to use. Like, these are, these are major non-starters in a world where we all rely on our apps now for, for so much. I mean, BlackBerry just cannot, pro, previous products just could not give people what the modern world um, offered them and offered them freely and readily on other devices. Um, so in retrospect, it looks like that, that was a, a critical gap. The problem then would have been, though, how would you reconcile the security issue um, that, came with, that came with Android devices? Um, and I think that would have been really tricky for the company that still had a stronghold in these very important markets like, um, uh, you know, like the government market and, um, and you know, and, and highly regulated enterprises. They probably should have had, maybe they should have gone to the market and raised some extra money and just had a division that did an Android phone and put one right out there and, and, and deployed the resources, to, <clears throat> excuse me, to get an Android phone out and perhaps see over time if that Android direction would be the right one, and they can then consume the rest of the company, kind of like a, kind of like a, that uh, innovator's dilemma approach. You know, they probably should have had two or three different approaches and seen which one worked in terms of the operating system. Um, but then maybe th this whole plan that Jim had to build the business around uh, BBM might have been the direction to go as well. Make BBM ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitously available on all devices. I mean, look at WhatsApp. WhatsApp filled the gap that BlackBerry left by not having BBM available um, for all smartphones to use. And it sold to Facebook for, what, 17 or $19 billion, which is three or four times what BlackBerry is worth now. Yes. So value creation, you could argue, would have been uh, to go all in on on this app that they had developed that was, su su was hugely popular. But again, go back to 2010, 2011. What would the shareholders have said? The yeah. board was against it, and half the company was against it, and and the market would have would have ridiculed them for it. Um, so it's really hard to make that decision for them in retrospect. It, it almost seems kind of, to an extent, with some of these tech companies, it almost se almost seems counterintuitive to have shareholders because they don't necessarily agree with some innovative steps that need to be taken by companies, right? Right. I love them or hate them, but they're the ones who provide the money. That, exactly. Uh, they, you know, so when you need to sell shares and raise half a billion dollars, that, that can be the easiest and most readily available right. source of funds. Exactly. I have one. Thank you for coming on, Sean. I have one last question I, I kind of just thought up of uh, while you were talking here. Um, I've been noticing in the mobile space now, it's kind of reached a plateau where there isn't really too much innovation going on. I mean, you look at the iPhone and the, the latest Android devices, they don't really have like that Steve Jobs moment where like a huge killer app or feature comes out and everybody's clamoring for a device. I mean, now it kind of seems to be like, okay, it's a new device, it's got better specs, better camera, the usual suspects, but it, it's, it doesn't really have anything that's like, wow, I gotta have this new device. It's kind of like, sure, I'll get that device just because I'm used to upgrading, but it's not you know, that killer device I need to get. And I'm just wondering from your view, what do you, where do you think the market is going uh, in the future because it, we have reached this plateau. I'm wondering what will be the next avenue do you think is gonna be touched on for, for revenue uh, in this market? Well, I mean, to think about this um, in just less than nine years, really. If you, if you start start with uh, Steve Jobs coming on stage you know, almost nine years ago, um, a bunch of companies um, and some of the smartest people in the world have put um, the internet, full internet capability, in the hands of just about everyone in the world. Well, a large portion of people. So 
that happened. They put the technology in our hands. Um, they did it through an arms race with all these cool innovations, um, and uh, and now we have the internet in our hands. So now we are living with the ability to do all these things wherever we go. And I know we can take that for granted because it's with us all the time, but what that means is we have not even begun to see what the impact is going to be. This now is like an appendage. This isn't something that's, you know, there's not a lot of probably innovation left in the uh, in the core product itself. They'll get faster. Uh, they'll probably get a little nicer. Uh, you know, the, the, the resolution on the cameras will get better. Maybe they'll do a couple of cool things. But now we're living our lives out of our palms. And what we can actually do there is just beginning to happen. Like, whole industries are going to be uh, rewritten, destroyed, grow up because we have this capability now. Like, it is still very early days. And while the phones themselves may not evolve a great deal, what we can do, what we will do, what we expect to do uh, is now going to change and continue to change to the point where we're going to look back at 2015 and say, I can't believe I only did those things on my <laughs> smartphone. <laughs> my entire life was was there. Um, you know, that and the advent of cloud computing. I mean, it's, it's really extraordinary if you think about it. Terrifying as well. Like Another book I would recommend everyone read is uh, Rise of the Robots by Martin Ford, which is actually the book that won the, uh, <laughs> won, won the, uh, won the award, um, uh, the FT award. It's actually got some very terrifying messages, which is that the level of automation has become so sophisticated that, you know, after 200 and some years since the re Industrial Revolution started, the, the machines are not just, you know, they're not just taking up menial uh, jobs now, but they're taking up far more sophisticated jobs that were that are done by white-collar people, and that this is going to have huge implications. So the, our world is changing very radically. Uh, it's, doing, it's happening in the palm of our hands. So I think we're going to see extraordinary change, but it's going to be more in how we interact with the world, how society is redrawn, where we go, how we go to places, what we're going to do now that we have these devices here. So that's where the big change is going to happen, not so much in the hardware or the software, but in how we use it to redraw our lives and our societies. It's interesting because you talk about computers taking over white-collar jobs, and I know there was a few years ago, wasn't there some investment firm who had computers automatically get triggered to make sales and they sold, they were automatically triggered to make a huge sale and they ended up losing that company like millions of dollars and they went out of business because of it and it's just, it's that funny link but of course today if you look at any competitive firm on Wall Street or on Bay Street, they're using these automated programs which are essentially computers buying and selling stocks based mm -hmm. on, you know, even news stories that come up. Uh, it's not Algorithms. just yeah. It's not just numbers that come in based on like quarterly earnings and stuff like that. It's, no, if there's if there's something that bad happens like somewhere in the world that triggers some of these computers to sell depending on what type of stock they own. It's it's an interesting view. Yeah, we're and we're all sort of we're in the early days of AI and machine learning as well. I don't think we're quite to Skynet just yet, but. Uh, <laughs> But certainly, uh, I mean, you read Martin Ford's book, and uh, and and definitely, you get a sense that the machines are getting smarter, and the scientists. Have, I mean, you look at Watson, you know, IBM's Watson. That's a perfect that example. And that's going to be look like primitive technology before long. And think about what that means. If the machines can actually learn and be intuitive, um, you know, they might not take over the world, but they're certainly going to be able to take over a lot more tasks than they do now uh, than hey. they're capable of doing now, which millions of people perform. Uh, to earn their living. Replying to an email and inbox, for instance, those are the recommended responses. I don't even have to think. It reads my email and says, hey, you should say, cool, done, looks great. It's like, okay, we're going to have emails talking to each other and no one's even going to read emails. <laughs> Maybe you could do my Christmas shopping for me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, anyways, thanks for coming on, Sean. We really appreciate you uh, coming on here. I know... Yeah. A lot of us, I, when I started reading the book, I was super excited about it, and, and, and a lot of the people, we have our own Barry Flow uh, BBM group, and I was constantly like referencing quotes from the book, and I'm like, holy cow, like, this is, this is really interesting that this stuff was going on behind the scenes, because I always, I always had a view, a different view of what was going on with the company, and then your book really changed that view for me, because I was... Let me preface this with, I came to BlackBerry kind of at the beginning of BB10. I never really got into it at its high peak. I was I was a big Apple fanboy before I started getting interested in BlackBerry. And I always had that 
you know, that view that BlackBerry was just lazy and just didn't innovate. They just kind of were, you know, resting on their laurels, you know, and, and not doing anything. But in reality, there's a lot more turmoil and, and different things going on behind the scenes. Um, and, and, yeah, and to that point, I just want to mention to people, uh, you can purchase uh, Losing the Signal uh, wherever books are sold. Um, if you don't want to get off your couch, you can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or Chapters in Indigo. Um, and also, I think uh, Chris has some goodies to, to mention here. Yeah, um, basically, we've um, I've gathered up five copies for everybody. So when the uh, if you're listening now, when the post does go live on Crackberry, you can just simply leave a comment there, and uh, we'll give away five copies of the book to uh, some winners. And, uh, of course, we'll in announce the winners on next week's uh, Berry Float. Awesome. So with that, uh, I guess I'll say goodbye. Uh, thanks for everybody for coming on and having some great discussion. Uh, and, and all the best with the, the Globe and Mail, Sean. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on here. Yeah, thanks so much, Sean. Very, very insightful, Sean. Thank you so much for coming on. All right. Take yeah. care, guys.